morning, everyone. Good morning, Donna. <laughs> Champlain. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, that was harsh. <laughs> Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society acknowledges that we are gathering on the land seized from the Western Anunnaki people. We understand a little of how the trauma of being displaced and disregarded has affected many generations of the Abenaki nation. We hope that within our generation, we will be able to grow in respect for the Abenaki culture, their spirituality, and the relationship to this land. Hello, my name is Donna Blazik. Sorry, I have to giggle at, at the spellings of my name that I see. <laughs> as you can only imagine, nine letters, one vowel. And I'll, <laughs> and I'll be your worship associate for today. Our own pastor, Barnaby Feeder, has the Sunday off. And Liam Batches Greenwood has volunteered to lead the service. You can read about him in the bulletin, and he'll talk plenty in a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, to whom who made our church beautiful and attractive throughout all the years, but especially working last week during Blue Jean Sunday, or preparing for this week by ushering, setting up technology, warming up the music, leading the choir, being a progressive, welcoming, vibrant community is truly a team effort. Thank you. If you'd like to be part of the team, sign our guest book, and we'll put you on, on our contact list. Better yet, join us for social hour afterwards and strike up a conversation with anybody you see. And we'll invite you to sing, clean windows, bake pies, operate the camera, or stand up here and ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> I won't sing ring the bell, which always comes to mind when I <laughs> you see that. There are various ways to connect with our community, and many of them are printed in the bulletin. One program listed in the bulletin is a relatively new group that is meeting at Shire Town Market on College Ave on Thursdays at 3.30, just before choir rehearsal. You can talk to Liam about that if you're interested. If you're interested in helping out with the Rhubarb Festival, then talk to Liam's husband, Mike Greenwood, or Lee Sanderson. We need plenty of rhubarb pies and desserts, so ask them how you can help. And I'm sure they won't rhubarb with you. <laughs> to rhubarb is to have a bitter squabble. But we don't, we don't do that here. We take the bitter stalks of life, cover it with butter and sugar, slide it into the oven, then meditate for 60 minutes at 400 degrees. <laughs> so if you have had any bitterness this week, share a sweet smile with those around you, and then join me in taking some deep breaths. Now if someone wants to turn up the thermostat to 400, we can start the transformation. Or we can start by singing breaths, 101 in your teal hymnal.
draw us into this time of reflection on how the lives of our ancestors have shaped our current lives, Liam wrote this gathering poem. The Archives of Bones by Liam Thatches Greenwood. I've been joking that I'm the Vatan White to uh, Liam's Pat Sajak. <laughs> I'd like to buy a vowel. <laughs> Someplace in the memory of our minds and in the archives of our bones, we may remember a time when we were scared and all alone. Yet, that is not now, and that is not here. Someplace in the photos of our family or the fears of our dreams, we, we may remember a time when we were rejected or unseen. Yet, here we see each other and work to learn each other's names. Our true names, the ones we write on labels stuck to our hearts, which we have brought us, which have brought us into this sanctuary, uncertain yet hopeful, that this will be a safe place to be human, to be ourselves. Some place in the archives of our bones, we may have known hunger, scarcity, insecurity, anger, anxiety, or fear. Yet that is not now, that is not here. Here we are breathing in presence. Here we are breathing in peace. Join me in our chalice lighting. <laughs> Flame of fire, spark of the universe, that warmed our ancestral hearth, agent of life and death, symbol of truth and freedom, help us to understand ourselves and our earthly home, one breath at a time. And now is the time for all ages. <laughs> and Poppy, Poppy is here, and I don't see any younger people yet. They ended up going. Okay, so this time, Poppy will be our person who's one of the all ages, and I get a chance to talk to Poppy, a complete role reversal. Okay, uh, you're you are up. I like that. I'd like you all to imagine that you're about 10 years old and some kid from school invited you over to their house and this is the house. And you wonder, huh, what's it like to live in this house? It might not look like your house. It might not look like a house that you're really expected your friend to come from. This house I'm really familiar with, though. This is my grandmother's house up in northern Michigan. And this is after it was fixed up. And so I'd invite you to this house, and I'd ask you to not judge the furniture of the house, but focus on the people. There might be questions that you have when you come into this house. It's okay to have questions, okay? But stay focused on grandma and the cousins that are going to come over and help play with us and, and have fun. And we'll be okay, Poppy, all right? The first thing is to just roll with it, okay? Um, one thing is that if you have to go to the bathroom, I'll hand you this and they'll show you the outhouse because grandma didn't have indoor plumbing. Well, she had a faucet of cold well water, but the plumbing that you might need when you go to the bathroom, when you want to roll, you're going to have to go to the outhouse. It's, it's, it's an experience <laughs> and it might be something that you're, you're not used to. Um, and then when you come into the house and you say, so what is there fun to do? 
and my grandmother says, oh, Poppy, you're here. Well, why don't you and Lee, Liam have a, a roll of wallpaper and, and do your numbers? Then she would introduce you to what she thinks is her favorite game for kids to do, in which she'd say, you start here, add one plus one, comes up with two, and then double that, two plus two, what does that get to be? And then two, uh, four plus four, what does that get to be? And while you're doing that, Liam will do it over here on this side of the table. I'll give you 10 minutes, find out what numbers you come up with, and then you can find out where you made a mistake and figure out who made the mistake and where. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how much fun it is to come up with a number like this. Can you read this? I, this is the, the trillions place. Uh, 35 trillion. What are, yeah. 1,278,672. Wow. I may have made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> the other thing is that you'll say, is there something to play with? And she'll say, yeah, there's the utility roll outside. Like Utility roll? And it's this big wooden spool that they had utility cables on, and the utility cables are gone. But it's this big spool. And you might say, it's like from a construction site. What, we're going to play with that? It's the most fun, really. To roll things in it, you can put stuff inside and hear it go clunk, 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 clunk. And you can roll down the hill. And if you get really daring, you can stand on top of the, 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 um, the wheel while somebody's holding your hand on both sides. And you can try your circus acting trick. And, you know, with me and my cousins, we could take turns. We've done it we've, plenty of times. Just roll with it, okay? Just roll with it. And if you don't come to grandma's house, but you go to somebody else's house, roll with it there too, as much as possible. Everybody's house is different. Some are really fancy, some are not fancy. Some have indoor plumbing, and some don't. And if you can focus on the people, they'll show you how to have fun, even with a roll of wallpaper scraps. Thank you for visiting Grandma's house. We're going to sing you back in. <laughs> Our singing out song is Tis a Gift to be Simple. And since you know that I'm a very staunch traditionalist, then I'm going to invite you to sing it, if you know the words, in the traditional way. It's a shaker hymn, and they believed in movement and how movement related to your spiritual life. So when it comes to, to turn, turn will be our delight till by turning, turning, we come round right, they really did turn. And they imagined letting centrifugal force just let go of the things that were complicating their life. So to turn, turn will be our delight till by turning, turning, we come round right. Not too fast so that you hit your cousin, but just fast enough that you imagine letting go of the complicated things in life. You may stand if you're able uh, in body or spirit. You may turn in body or spirit.
bookshelf called Have a Heart, and he, as a resident of Bristol, knows more about it than I do, and he's agreed to talk to us a bit about it. Almost, but not quite. Okay, so as Liam said, um, our donee for this month is the Bristol Have a Heart Food Shelf. Um, and I'm, go I'm simply introducing the donee for this month. Next week, there'll be a person who's much more knowledgeable, who is one of the coordinators of Food Shelf, of Have a Heart, to tell us more about the Food Shelf but also share some of her experiences and some of the people that she's run into while um, helping at the food shelf. <clears throat> um, the food shelf is located in St. Ambrose Catholic Church, and this is one of many food shelves throughout the front of Vermont that serves a really critical function in providing nutrition to hungry individuals and families throughout the area. What I really wanted to do was share a couple of vignettes about hunger. So Thursday evening, um, after choir, I spoke to William about today, and he had this idea, he had this idea about yellow cards and hunger, and all I could think of was that's really, yellow cards, they're not really a nutritional need. <laughs> okay, but uh, then Liam said, well, what I want people to do is share a time when they've experienced food insecurity. Can you do that? And I, my answer was yes, but I don't remember. And he said, well, can you talk about it? And I said, yeah, Liam, but I don't remember. And then I explained. So I was born, my mother told me, over and over, in a place that was, at the time, a war zone. And the city that we lived in um, was surrounded by other forces, and no food could get into the city. Um, and my mother told me about having to scrounge, having dandelion greens, having whatever was available, and that was the menu while she was pregnant and apparently shortly after I was born. Now for me, fortunately, I don't remember that. I don't feel scarred by that. I heard about it, but it's kind of like out there. But I'll share another little vignette. I was thinking about, uh, well, yesterday evening, I was after dinner, sitting on the couch in our living room. And um, I was looking out, and we're very blessed to our uh, east and to our south. There are mountain ranges when you look out, and it's just gorgeous. It is just absolutely beautiful. And I feel that way quite frequently having made a decision five decades ago to live in an urban area that I lived in and come to Vermont. Um, but I was sitting there and I'm thinking about, God, I feel so blessed to be in this place. And then I thought about today. And thinking about today and what I had to say, I was thinking about, well, food, food insecurity. And for me, when I think about that, what I come up with is, I don't get it. I don't get it. We live here in Vermont, it's a beautiful place. I know people have beautiful homes, they drive beautiful cars. How can we not make available food to those who need it? And last night was not a solitary incident. Um, it's something I think about over and over again. And my thinking is, and I know that as an individual, it makes me sad. And I also feel relatively powerless. I can do a little, but I can't solve the problem. But the other thing I felt was hope. And my hope is that as a community,
community, as a state, as a nation, we can solve this problem. So anyway, I encourage you to give as generously as you can, and I will let Liam tell you about the yellow cards. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. And no, don't eat the yellow cards. But there may have been a time in your life when you hit a time of food insecurity. And that's a milestone in your life. Hopefully, you've come past that milestone. But if you don't mind sharing it, then put it on the yellow card. Because it helps us empathize with our neighbors who may be going through those times of insecurity. Thank you. two yellow cards. One thing that is on my mind is how is Jerry doing, but I don't know if I can ask in public. What do you... Poppy, how is Jerry doing? <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, so I would say, I mean, it's really been a roller coaster. Um, like honestly in the last week we've gone through being told he was going to die and we should prepare for that um, and grandkids came and said goodbye and then he got much much better and they said he's going to be out of the ICU we're ready to move him to a normal floor uh, that was a couple days ago and then his oxygen got kind of worse again <laughs> um, so the status right now is he's at UVM in the intensive care unit on where he's been the whole time, which is only eight days, which is crazy. Um, he's been, yeah, so he's there. My mom has been up there the whole time staying in a hotel <clears throat> and is there 
for the foreseeable future, and I've been, I was there until pretty recently staying there. So a bunch of us are going and doing shifts. Um, he's, I mean, his oxygen is starting to get better again. So I don't, I don't know. Like, I mean, it, d it depends on what day you ask me, right? I was, like, two days ago, they were like, he's doing so well. We think he might be ready to go right to Fanny Allen. Oh, he had a stroke also, if you don't know that. So, um, right, so he had COVID pneumonia, and that was why he went to the hospital and almost died. And that's much, much better, but then he had a stroke. <clears throat> so his full left side can't um, move, but it's starting to move a little bit. I mean, my dad is really scrappy. <laughs> like, so I don't know. I go from thinking like, oh, he's totally going to make it, and we're going to you know, be dealing with ramps and house renovations, and then thinking, I don't know, maybe he's, maybe he's not. Um, I guess that's all. Well, I'll just say one more thing, which is uh, it's helpful if people do spread news, actually. Like, is it the more people know, the less I have to keep giving updates. But um, I'm also hoping to start a GoFundMe page for house stuff, especially if that hopefully needs to happen, um, and some medical stuff and hotels and things like that. Um, and right now, I don't have another way to help. But assuming he comes back, there will be a lot to do. Oh, and sorry, this is really the last thing. Um, he, do, he and mom really do like seeing notes and texts. They don't want to talk on the phone to any, I mean, my dad can't, but mom, I think, doesn't want to talk on the phone to anybody, but like messages and I don't know, new, random news about funny things, and, you know, whatever is great. Thank you, because our hearts spend with you and Jerry and the whole family. Um, our heart also goes out to to D, D, Lila, sweet calico cat and wonderful companion. She died Monday, May first, and it was her twentieth birthday. But she will be dearly missed. Yeah. Marnie has a uh, milestone, too, that is really very significant. A true milestone has been accomplished this past Monday when Governor Scott signed into law the removal of the residency requirement from our state's medical, medical aid in dying law, known as Act 39. Vermont is the first state in the U.S. to have this right of choice for a terminally ill patient who is not not, who is not required to be a resident. This is excellent information. Uh, excuse me. Excellent information is available on the website of Patient Choices Vermont or speak to me, Marnie. I'm on the board of PCV. And for those of you who don't know Marnie, she's this beautiful person over here. Yes, thank you, Marnie. <laughs> thank you. Um, those are some of our milestones and passages. If you are aware of a milestone and passage, or you think of people going through times of insecurity, food insecurity, then let us be mindful of those as we have some minutes of meditation.
is our world is one world. What touches one affects us all. The seas that feed and water us, the earth that holds and feeds us, the sun that warms us, the clouds that cover us, and the rains that fall. Our world is one world. What touches one affects us all. There are more, but I'll leave you with those.
So I didn't think of this until the choir <coughs> was assembling. I do have a, what would have been a yellow card for Liam, it goes with our theme of food insecurity, that I'll share. So when I was a kid, I grew up in southern New Jersey, and there was a couple farmer's fields near, uh, sounding, surrounding our development. And one year, the farmers grew lima beans, and we had lima beans all winter long. To this day, I do not like lima beans. We had so many freaking lima beans. <laughs> and, um, and I honestly, okay, I'm, I'm the youngest of four, so, and my grandfather lived with us, so our family was a decent size. And my parents were of a working class. And uh, I, I honestly thought for years on end that my father had stolen lima beans <laughs> to feed our family. And it was only in a, a few years ago that my brother, we were talking about this, and my brother said, oh yeah, the farmers would let people glean the beans after. <laughs> so there was years that I thought we were living off of stolen lima beans. <laughs> but we were living off of lots and lots of free lima beans. So there's my tale of hunger. <laughs> so I'm going to read um, our first reading. It's a poem by the title of Mending by David Alex Axelrod, excuse me, from the collection Healing the Divide, edited by James <laughs> Cruz. <clears throat> you knelt over the rag rug my grandmother wove from the clothes she wore, heavy wool skirts and jackets she sewed decades ago. It was a large rug you mended with needle and thread, but you seemed small at the center of it. Those thick, colorful braids of tartan, donegal, houndstooth, and tweed swirling all around you. Opening a portal already four lifetimes deep. You laughed, looped another stitch, tied off the tailor's knot, tailor's knot and cut the thread with your teeth. Thank you, Donna, for the lima bean story and that poem. Our second reading is also a poet writing about a grandparent. And it's our poet laureate, current poet laureate, Ada, Ada Lamon, and the poem Heart on Fire. As a foster child, my grandfather learned not to get into trouble. Mexican and motherless, dead as she was from tuberculosis, he practiced words in a new language and kept his slender head down. When the other boys begged him to slip into the music shop's upper window to steal harmonicas for each of them, music being important, thievery being secondary, he refused. When the cops came, to spot the boys who robbed the music store, they could easily find the ones spitting broken notes into the air, joyously mouthing the stainless steel, mimicking men on street corners, busking for coins. But not my grandfather. He knew not to risk it all for a stolen moment of exultation. It's easy to imagine this is who I come from, a line of serious men who follow the rules. But I might add that later he was a dancer, a singer, an actor whose best roles ended up on the cutting room floor. A cut up, a ham, who liked a good story, who would have told you life was a series of warnings, and also magic. Once, he was sent for a box of matches. He put that box of strike anywheres in the pocket of his madras shirt and ran home. He ran so fast to be on time, to be good, and when he did so, the whole box ignited. <laughs> so 
he was a boy running down the canyon road with what looked like a heart on fire. He'd laugh when he told you this, a heart on fire. He'd say this so you'd remember. Why do poets write about their grandparents? I think they realize that the emotional home rug that they're standing on are, is made by all those memories woven together. It is the place that they feel at home and they can tell their story. Hmm. I think we all look for a place of home like salmon swimming upstream, following our nose to those ancestral grounds so we can know this is the place where we belong. That quest for home, it can take generations. It takes four generations for Eastern monarch butterflies. Their multi-generational journey begins when, when spring arrives in Mexico and awakens those wintering butterflies. They mate and travel north. The first generation does, travels north for just one month, and then they die. And the second generation, they also continue the journey north. Usually they make it to the Midwest, and then they breed and die. The third generation, they're the ones who make it to Vermont or to Canada, if they're lucky. And in the fall, the fourth generation, the fourth generation are the super monarchs. And they make that long trek to Mexico in one lifetime and end up arriving in the same forest, some of them on the same tree as their great-grandparents. Wow. In the same way that butterflies fo follow that guiding information and those memories that have been stilled in them, we also follow what's been instilled in us. Hmm. This weekend alone, England invested, what, $250 million in the idea that classism is handed down from generation to generation. And class, social class, is an ontological reality that we somehow inherit in our bones by creating a religious, political, and, oh, religious, religious, political, and cultural fanfare they hoped to instill in Charlie and those who know him the idea that Charlie is royalty. Of course, if he is a monarch, he is following a super monarch who has had a very long journey. And the next generation only lasts for a month. <laughs> FYI, as far as I know, biologists have not been able to isolate the royalty gene in the human species, but it is through social etiquette, consolidation of wealth, education, fine dining, and other privileges that the idea of royalty is nonetheless woven into some people's bones. And I happen to know that deep within my bones, I am not royalty. <laughs> I'm a peasant who is trying to feel comfortable in the merchant class, trying to pull it off. And today I want to talk to you about how classism is transferred from one generation to another. And 
this whole conversation of classism can have different starting points. Isabel Wilkerson's and Cass' beautiful book makes the case that racism is the beginning of class in the United States, that what we did to BIPOC people, enslaving, displacing, oppressing, abusing, and treating them as less than human, that is classism, that trauma has been passed on from generation to generation and has plagued this nation for centuries. Great book. Matthew Desmond and Howard uh, Zinn. Howard Zinn in his landmark book, A People's History of the United States, and Matthew Desmond in his very recent book, Poverty by America, says it's not racism that's the beginning of America's struggle with class. It's really capitalism. Capitalism and the capitalists, our own aristocracy, used race used ethnic division in order to create this discontent. And yes, the system makes us feel powerless, vulnerable, at odds with each other while our aristocracy gets richer. Now we could explore these options. They're great book groups. I couldn't cover it in 10 minutes and we would stay in our head. So I want to shift instead to the heart and tell you some stories about my own struggles with classism. And I do this well aware that many of you have stories of your own, whether it's stealing lima beans or being born in a war zone. But if we can share our stories, my belief is that we'll be able to create a space where more and more people feel at home, even when they're feeling vulnerable. So I offer you six little snapshots. They will be an orange futon, moldy bread, a cow tongue sandwich, streets made of red brick, and Ritz crackers. First, oh, I forgot the first one, a dresser drawer, a dresser drawer. That's my first one. My father, Don, slept in a dresser drawer until he was six years old. Um, I'm going to give up on this so, and just stay at the podium because I'd like to wander away from the podium, but then the sound keeps going in and out. So excuse me while I unwire myself, okay? So my dad, for the first six years of life, slept in a dresser drawer. His father, John Batches, uh, was a factory worker in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He had eight children. My dad was number seven. And when number eight was born, my father's mother died in childbirth and left this widow, widower, with eight kids. Fortunately, just down the street, there was a widow named Helen who had seven kids. All 15 of them ruled the street. And so they merged the two families into a small house about the size of the house that Mike and I are living in right now. And my dad's bed was a dresser drawer. They pulled out the lower dresser drawer, supported it with some bricks underneath, because there were already four kids in the double bed and there was no space for him to sleep until some of the older kids moved out of the house. So it took a few years. And in that image, I see a snapshot of vulnerability of a child who is six years old, lost his mother, lost his father, and is sleeping every night in a dresser drawer supported by bricks, waiting for some of his siblings to leave so that he could have a space in bed. It's a very small space in the world that my dad was allowed to occupy. Fast forward 80 years, and I found myself sleeping on a fold-out orange futon during a homeless period. Let me, let me explain as quickly as I can that 
when I went through a divorce, I did so so that my ex-wife could marry the Australian that she really wanted to be with. And so she went to Australia and I cashed in my life savings so that I could also go to Australia and enroll myself in a graduate program, earn a degree in uh, special education, and I got a job at a, at a school and things were going okay. It was good to be there with my kids and then the uh, politics changed. They changed the rules of immigration and I had to leave the country with the, the understanding that when immigration says yes, oh, I could apply for a parent visa, which was $50,000, $50,000, and when immigration said yes, I had 30 days to get back to Australia or I would have to reapply. So with that, I started on a journey of homelessness, substitute teaching in Michigan, and a friend of mine let me stay on his futon in a trailer, in the small room of the trailer, and I slept on that futon for three years. I was laying there feeling vulnerable, like powerless, not able to change the politics or the economics of this. I started having nightmares. And they were the nightmares of my childhood. Whenever I went to bed, bed was not a place of security, but of vulnerability. I just couldn't sleep easily. I started thinking about my dad, first six years of life supported by that dresser drawer. During the day, hey, put on my clothes, get the, the, the substitute teaching tie on, be the quirky Mr. Batches. I was good. At night, I became a vulnerable little boy on that futon and reminded over and over that some of the kids that I had in my class, they might not have had a bed. They you know, might have been staying on a couch or sleeping in blankets or having a dresser drawer of their own. You go through periods of vulnerability. Hmm. Third snapshot. Saturday mornings in the 1970s. I'm six years old. Dad is somewhat laid off from General Motors where he's working and we're going through a time. Mom is taking me to a uh, local farmer's, and I find myself in this wooden shed with a bunch of awkwardly silent adults waiting. And this pickup truck backs up in the one side of the shed, and it's filled with 55-gallon barrels that's filled with expired bread, pastries, and other groceries from the grocery store. Expired and given to this farmer so that he could feed it to the hogs. But before he feeds it to the hogs, he has invited people that he knows to be going through a vulnerable time. They can sort through the, ba the, the barrels and find things, fill their own grocery bags and pay him $3 per bag. Um, and my mom brings me along because she knows I can't sit still and I would love to dig through the barrels and find whatever I could. Truth is, I wanted to do it because I didn't want to bring moldy bread home. My mom was okay with that. She'd bring the moldy bread home and cut off pieces and make French toast, but I was afraid that my friends would come over for a sandwich after school or something and see that we had bread that had molded on it and I would be embarrassed. So I made sure I got the best stuff that wouldn't have mold that we could take home. But while I'm digging through the barrel, I realized we are kind of at the bottom of the barrel, aren't we? Yeah. And there was this feeling of embarrassment. My mother kind of reinforced that feeling of embarrassment because when we went to church, we had to sit in the balcony, and my mom explained she didn't want to sit on the main floor because that's where people would judge her. She wouldn't be a room mother at uh, my elementary school because she didn't want to be judged by the other parents. And ironically, the more she explained to me that she didn't want to be judged, the more I felt 
judged mm -hmm. and embarrassed about my family. This feeling of shame has a very particular taste in my mouth. And that is the taste of a cow tongue sandwich. Well, let me explain. Not only did my mom kind of hook up with this hog farmer to get these leftovers, she also hooked up with a friend who worked at a butcher shop. And he would come over to our house and bring in cuts of meat that weren't really marketable. Chicken livers and gizzards and um, cow tongue or tails and my mom would use the bread and slice up these things and send me to school on Wednesdays with a lunch of, of these things. Um, Wednesday was hot dog lunch day at our school. We didn't, otherwise you'd have to carry your lunch, but it was hot dog lunch day. For a dollar, you could have a hot dog, a bag of chips, and some milk. And that was more than my family could afford so I went one day in second grade with uh, my own sandwich. And when I was opening it up, I was kind of expecting peanut butter. And there was this tongue sticking out at me. And a person named Gary, who is now my brother-in-law, a person who is <laughs> named Gary, <laughs> looks over and says, Batches, what are you eating? It looks like a it is a tongue. Oh my gosh. And he picks it up and says, look what Batches is eating. You guys, it's a real tongue. Oh my gosh. And with that, it's like, I dare you to eat it. And then the class starts chanting, eat it, eat it, eat it. So I was like, yes, I can. Mmm. Mmm. And I ran to the wastebasket, and with great drama, I got rid of the cow tongue sandwich. And people were like, oh, gross, that's terrible. The teacher comes in, has to settle us down. And I settle down and quietly content myself with um, not eating. And I did digest something that day. I digested that memory into a permanent feeling of shame. And it comes up at the strangest time. It comes up when I feel criticized. It comes up when I feel mocked. All of a sudden, that feeling, that lurching in my stomach comes up. It comes up, this is really odd, when I'm at a restaurant that is higher than the crackle, Cracker Barrel kind of restaurants that my family could stretch for. It comes up when I'm at a restaurant and Mike orders dessert, like at the Bobcat in Bristol, um, because somehow I, I don't deserve that. And the shame comes up and I don't do dessert. Um, I bring that up, that memory of shame, not to gross you out. One, to explain why I'm a vegetarian now. <laughs> and two, because many of us have experiences of shame that we carry around. And it gets triggered in ways that others would find innocuous. My husband can order dessert and I feel shame? It doesn't make any sense. It only makes sense if you're in my story. I don't know what your story is but we have those snapshots. Oh, now I'm giving you the impression that growing up lower class is like all nastiness, but there were some really good memories, some very good memories, and some of them from my grandmother's home. Let me shift to that home in Michigan. One day, while playing in grandma's house in the attic, I discovered a set of postcards. They were written from my grandfather, William, 
who I take my name from. And it was to his dear Maggie, written in 1930, before they were married. And he was working, during the Depression, at Lane Brick Road. He had traveled from northern Michigan down to Grand Rapids and had laid roads in their downtown area. He then went on to travel down to St. Louis, and there was a postcard from St. Louis and some and notes about the jazz that he heard and the, the streets that he laid. And there was, then he traveled down to Phoenix, Arizona, and was laying bricks down there during the winter. And then he worked his way back up to Chicago and laid brick roads in preparation for the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. And while he was there, he was amazed at all the things that were coming into the World's Fair. He bought this tie. He bought this tie at the World's Fair. So this tie is, what, uh, 90 years old? 90 years old. He was so amazed by flamingos. He saw some flamingos in the zoo, a very exotic thing. And so he bought this tie because it could fit into his luggage and he could show his dear Maggie these exotic things. But <coughs> stay in any of the places where he laid bricks. He wanted to get back to northern Michigan, the hills of northern Michigan, to be with Maggie. Huh, that's where he felt at home. And I love that during a time of hardship, he had an adventuresome spirit, was willing to travel, worked hard, and then returned home in the right time. Well, fast forward when my divorce hit and all things, everything hit the fan, it was during the, the, the big recession of, of 2008. And so my wife and I were both having trouble finding jobs. And since I couldn't be a pastor anymore because it was leaking out that I had a different orientation than they uh, would allow, I chose my grandfather's path. Let me be adventuresome, let me travel, and then later on I'll find a place of home. I found that place of home here in the hills of Vermont, which are like the hills where my grandmother's house is. When I'm traveling down Route 7, it feels like William on his way to Maggie and Liam on his way to Michael. Okay, I see that I've talked too much. I worried about that. I have one more snapshot, and then we're off to coffee hour. And it's a snapshot of Ritz crackers. And for that, I want to thank Alan, Mike, and everybody who makes Social Hour possible. You see, when we're together as a group, you are a lovely, thoughtful, amazing group of people. But this beautiful sanctuary and our intellectual conversations, they sometimes make me feel out of place and vulnerable. I know in my bones I'm lower class or lower middle class or whatever. I just don't belong here. And I know you don't intend that. But then I go down to, to social hour and Alan serves Ritz crackers. There is nothing better comfort food for moderately challenged, economically challenged people than Ritz crackers. My mom would get these boxes of Ritz crackers from the food pantry, and they were probably past their sell-by date also. They were not crisp or crunchy. And she found a recipe for mock apple pie, and she would make this apple pie without apples and lemon and sugar and butter and my dad would say ooh this is a dessert of high class we are definitely putting on the Ritz <laughs> and it made me feel it makes me feel at home you never know what will help someone feel at home. I share these snapshots because it helps us build empathy with anybody who comes to us. We don't know what they're going through, but they are looking for a sense of home. You know, as a congregation, we're, we want to 
grow as a congregation by reaching out, some people have said, by reaching out to young families. And I think that's so cute. Every church in America <laughs> wants to grow by reaching out to young families. And we can try. It's a good path. But I think the more interesting and challenging path is to ask ourselves, how can we create a space? How can we do church? How can we talk with each other in such a way that even people from lower class will feel at home here. Then we will be a community of equity and justice. Hey, we have that conversation. I'll bring the mock apple pie. <laughs> Blessed be. Our hymn is, we are a gentle, Angry people, 170. comfort food that so many people need. Thank you for growing in that path. 
may we all go downstairs to social hour and enjoy some Ritz crackers. <laughs> We don't have coffee or crack.